Stephen wrote to me um, about six months ago or thereabouts uh, as a result of attending a conference in New Orleans and he had heard Dr. Elizabeth Blood speaking there and she was talking about Southbridge and the translation that she had done on Felix Gatineau's book yeah. which is a seminal book for us folks in Southbridge but also um, Dr. Blood had done a lot of research on just Southbridge, Southbridge history and how the French Canadians you know were as such a force here in this community in the early 1900s. So it was really uh, so fortuitous and so out of the blue. And I was so thrilled because it meant that we now had somebody who was going to present during uh, our national poetry event. And thanks to Stephen for reaching out to some other very accomplished poets, we now have a group of four Franco-American poets who are going to present for us this evening. And I would like to just read a, uh, a short introduction. And there is one of the names, and I've tried practicing, and I may get it wrong, so please excuse me if I do. Um, so the, uh, these, this evening's event is called Franco-American Words That Sing and That Matter, Celebrating National Poetry Month. We are delighted to welcome our four writers who bring diverse experience and approaches to the creative work. Cheryl Sothego is a French Abenaki poet and writer who has received fellowships in poetry from the NEA and the Massachusetts Artists Foundation and was a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize. Her most recent <coughs> book of poems is Mother Land. Ellen La Flesh, the winner of several national poetry awards, including the Ruth Stone Poetry Prize, has authored three chapbooks of poetry, including Beatrix. In addition to poetry, in, in to our poetry publications. Sally Bellarose's credits in, include her novel, The Girls Club, and she has won an NEA fellowship. And Stephen Ringan's most recent book is Fellow Odd Fellow. He edits the new, the new Franco American literary e journal, Resonance. Hope the pronunciation is fine. So, in towns and cities throughout New England, a significant percentage of the population is Franco-American, uh, is of Franco-American heritage. Yet, this ethnic group has often survived by avoiding notice and blending in. These four poets break that traditional silence by exploring varied facets of Franco-American <coughs> experience. <coughs> so, I think that sets the tone very much for our event this evening and I am so thrilled that we could do this and to be the host and I thank Stephen again for reaching out and for making this happen and hopefully um, we will arrange to buy the poetry books that are available this evening so for folks at home who would like to uh, dip into some of the Franco-American poetry at a later stage we will have them available in our collection. So uh, without further ado I would like our first speaker to please come. Thank you. This is Sally Dalros. I, I think I think you can all hear me. Yes. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Stephen, um, for putting this together. I'm honored to be with the French Canadian being with Stephen, Ellen, and Cheryl. Um, and thank you all for coming and listening yeah. tonight. It's not um, I, I was wondering if I had enough material to read tonight, and I was going through my work, and I and. 90% of what this? I write has something to do with being French Canadian, so I had <laughs> way too much. So, um, so I sort of went through it and, and tried to come up with a theme. And what I came up with was work and mime. mime. So um, that's what I'll be reading. My paternal grandmother, my mime, came from Western Massachusetts, from Acadia, Maine. Um, and many of the particulars of where she came from and who she came from were never clear, at least to me and to most of the rest of the family. I think because they were never particularly clear to her and some of her past she was told not to speak about. And so, so she didn't, although she would give you hints. Um, anyways, one of her stops as a young girl that Mime often spoke about was Fall River, where she worked in a mill, a, shirt, a shirtwaist factory. So um, I'm going to read a poem about Mimi and the Shirtwaist Factory, and a few words that might need uh, explanation if you haven't worked the loom are warp and weft, which are the horizontal and transverse um, threads, um, the weft guiding, guiding. Um, waist silk, which is the scrap left over from in the mills, not necessarily silk, um, and shuttle wise, which is how the shuttle goes, but it's also anything that comes at you sideways. So that explanation is longer than the book. 
Memnard does time in the shirtwaist factory. She sings, she works, she won't be gotten. She hides her pennies in her stocking. She warps and wefts and steals the waist silk. For the children she would be rocking, makes the loom sing lullabies. She works, she sings, she won't be got. She has 12 nickels in her sock. She works, she won't be gotten. She sings, she won't be got. She works, she works, she works. Stitches quilts of stolen silk, sells to rich men's wives, folds her money in her pocket. Girls like her, a dime a dozen, become not rich, but shuttle wise. Um, so this next poem is about a paper mill in Holyoke, Massachusetts, where Mime, my mom, and I all worked. It's uh, called, Nash it was called National Bank Blank Book. Later it was called The Eagle Factory. And in my time there, there were many, many French Canadian and Puerto Rican people working in the factory. National Blank Book. A factory built of brick, surrounded by canals, National Blank Book produced paper, blank, lined, and bound, by the gross and by the ton, spiraled, graphed, embossed paper. Raw pulp was pressed into diaries, pads, date books, birth and death books, in shades of white and every color. Every girl wanted to work a line with color. On Thursday when the rain came, the girls working the line were glad. Nice weather on a workday meant trouble. Bent our minds towards sabotage. We'd trip fire alarms, jam cardboard and punch presses. The foreman carrying his clipboard wanted workers for the weekend. Check names of girls who would, X names of girls who wouldn't. My cousin Jean Marie, afraid of being X'd, always said yes. Outside was midday, but already early evening dark. Inside, eight foot lengths of fluorescent lights hung from cable above the assembly line. Rain slapped the roof. Wind spat water on 12 foot windows, long since sealed shut. We heard the downpour through hall, through holes in the noise of metal punching paper, cutting, hacking, all that product moving. Conversation was not possible. Every girl was left to her own thoughts. I thought about my cousin, Jean Marie, so old, 28, with her 10 year seniority, had gotten me this job and stood now at the end of the line sorting guest books, throwing the faulty into a bin to be sold at the company store for cut rates. Jean Marie, timid, looking 40, scared to use the bathroom, afraid of being alone with the rats that scurry when stall doors closed, or worse, stood in a corner Beady eyes watching. The foreman took me off assembly to stack my cousin's maligned and mangled cast-offs. A plum job, off alone by the big dirty window, working at my own pace, which was fast, or I wouldn't have been chosen. One factory girl allowed to labor alone until a tailless rat appeared and sat on the deep sill, gnawing a piece of bread. That clever rat with no tail had been stealing from coat pockets and lunch pails for weeks. Somewhere, excuse me, somewhere far off, crack followed boom. Not the excitement of thunder and lightning, just factory noises from the second floor. The rat and I stared each other down, glanced away just long enough to get our separate jobs done. <laughs> The lunch whistle blew, paper stopped moving, the rat gnawed on. The rat's teeth were yellow, its fur thick and wet. Desperate to check my fear, I clapped my hands. When the rat did not move, I decided it was factory death. I was 18, my hearing was intact. The rat showed its teeth and I showed mine. 10 years seniority and Jean Marie, still afraid to say no to working Sundays, scared me more than yellow teeth and slick wet fur. All I wanted was outside that factory. I was hungry, there was much time. Trained to be quick, I willed my left hand to inch toward the crowbar slowly. I never felt sorry for any living creature except perhaps myself and Jean Marie. I heard the metal, cold and solid, damned if I would leave my cousin 
while the lunch, while that lunch squealing, stealing rat roamed the mill. We get some papers. My mom, we sold my mom's house, and there's a bunch of papers that came in from that, from Acadia and had some stuff to do with a land sale, land sale. So, so I'm getting some info. Anyways, this is called Guns and Good Little Indians. Mimer means grandmother. The word Mime sometimes abused to suggest a fat, lazy old woman. My Mime was fat, hard working, glad to rest and eat a hearty meal given the chance. Her husband Pepe drank. He hunted with a shotgun. Mime loved Pepe. She bore his ten children and his drinking, cooked and served what he shot. Mime was soft spoken, except when she wasn't. She had a few strict rules. One rule, Booze and hunting must never go together. One day Pepe drank, went hunting, and came home puffed up because he had bagged two deer. He waved around the shotgun, scaring the grandkids. Mime grabbed his gun, poured Pepe one stiff drink, then another. When he was passed out, Mime took his shotguns apart, buried the pieces all over their small farm. Pepe often told the story of how Mime brought her native ways from Canada through Maine to Massachusetts, how he lost his shotguns to his wife, how he was head of the family, but a woman had a right to home rules that a man was bound to follow. When please, Mime called her grandkids, my good little Indians. We grandkids would dig in their yard, searching. On rare occasions, we'd find some piece of metal we thought was part of Pepe's shotgun. Three days before she died, Meme announced she was ready to go and took to her bed. Eight of her children were still alive and came to say goodbye. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren, neighbors, relatives, all came to say goodbye. My family lived on the second floor of Meme's small farmhouse until I was three when my father built a house next door. F, bless you. After we moved into the new house, I kept creeping back to Mime. I was 11 when Mime died. By then, my mother had long since stopped caring that I spent so much time with my grandmother. As she lay dying, I watched the steady procession of mourners in and out of Mime's house. I sat on the, my bike, wondering why people who only came at Christmas bothered my Mime now. It was autumn. I squinted in the sun. My mother kept vigil, running between the houses. She saw me scowling on my bike. Go sit with Mime, my mother said. I wanted to sit with Mime, but didn't want to share her, so I bolted her outside door behind me. I knew better than to lock that door. Mime rented her second floor to a family with two young boys. Sooner or later, there would be a pounding, if not my mother or a renter, a mourner with a cousole. Mime rested on her back on her feather bed, propped up, seated, dressed in her best nightgown. Her chin tweezed, her hair washed, her eyes closed. But she was still Mime, her chest wide and loose, rising and falling. I was not scared, not one little bit. Death could not have her. She was my Mime. I sat on the soft, lumpy bed. Mime opened her eyes. Potale, she said using my nickname, come closer, Potale, because I knew better than to beg. I lay next to her on the bed and asked, why do they all keep coming? Ah, they come to weep, it's expected, Mime laughed. But we know each other, eh? You don't have to cry, unless you want to. I'm going away, but you, and of course. Then came the pounding at the door, and we had to let them in. But not before, Mime said, with her crooked s smile, you, my good little Indian, must stay. So, um, so now I'm happy to say I'm a Mime. And this is, um, this is, I'm trying to pass this off as a poem. It's really a short prose piece. It's called <laughs> Do What You Gotta Do, and it's about our granddaughter, Kennedy. That's a good Canuck name, Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, do What You Gotta Do. Three-year-old Kennedy is dancing, interpreting Nina Simone's, I need a little sugar in my bowl. She sways side to side and bends at the waist, letting her dirty blonde hair and fingernips, fingertips sweep the floor. Nina sounds like a boy, she says. Kennedy has been on a first-name basis with the artist since she could talk. She's up right now. 
Her feet are planted 20 inches apart on the carpet, arms swaying over her head, keeping slow time. Her hips sway left as her arms arc right. She claims to be Ariel, the little mermaid, and she calls me Flounder. She does look like a sea anemone. I need a little Swedish in my bowl, she sings in her high, thin voice. Story Hour and Daycare has been featuring children from around the world. It occurs to me not for the first time her mom might not approve of her daughter memorizing the words to this particular Nina Simone song. I decide it's time to retire Nina before she gets me in trouble. The CD ends. I eject it and put it in its jewel case at the bottom of the pile. How about some Sergeant Pepper, I ask Kennedy. She used to like the Beatles, but now she holds her nose. She says, Mime, isn't Nina lovely? Her use of the words Mime and lovely slay me. I am wrapped, I am undone. She is three years old and she uttered the words Mime, isn't Nina lovely? There has never been a more articulate, talenter, cuted kid. I am willing to risk our daughter-in-law's disapproval to nurture this child genius. You want more, Nina, I ask. But I am too slow in asking. She's got a life-size plastic blowfish in her hand and is racing around the room with it. I'm Tinkered Bell. You be cheese, she says. I believe I know this cheese character. Cheese is a mousy little mouse who does whatever Tinkerbell tells him to. I don't want to be Cheese. I want to be Nina, or at least I want to dance to Nina. I take Nina out of her jewel case and turn the volume low. W why do you have a fish, Tinkerbell, I ask. It's a flying fish. We're flying, Kennedy says. Nina sings, do what you got to do. Nina can be Peter Pan. She says, she and the blowfish stop racing around the room. She drags her step stool in front of the couch, stands in it, and waves the fish over her head. I'm the only one who can't fly, I complain. You and Peter Pan and Nina can be a boy mouse, Kennedy says, with big wings like a dragon. She spreads her arms, roars, and trips off the step stool. I'm all right, she says quickly, landing on her knees. She stays on her knees, squeaks, and crawls under the dining room table. I peek under the tablecloth. Come on, Nina, she says. Hide from the dragon with me. And just like that, I, Mime, am Nina Simone, taking a breather for a moment under my dining room table before I slay the next dragon. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> to lower the microphone. So something that we talk a, a lot about with French Canadians is how we've become or always have been invisible. And one of the areas where we're most invisible, which drives me crazy, as we probably have been the largest and most voracious fan base of the Boston Red Sox <laughs> for 100 years, through 86 years without a pennant even. We were so loyal. So that silence ends tonight. We're going to have some baseball poetry. So 10 years ago, I took my family to see the Pawtucket Red Sox, which is the minor league team for the Boston Red Sox. And Pawtucket is a great mill town, and I have extended cousins and family there. My mom was so excited. And then, in this amazing French-Canadian wonderful thing, when it came time to throw out the first pitch, these nuns came pouring out of the dugout. <laughs> True story, right? My family was there. True story. And it was to thank them for their service to the community as nurses and teachers. So I wrote a poem about this mother superior, 80 years old, throwing a split-fingered fastball. It was just amazing. So I'm going to try to do this without peeking. Sister Beatrice throws out the first pitch. Sister ascends the mound, quiets the organist with, his, with her palm. The catcher kneels. He needs a god darn miracle to rise from this minor league limbo. The stadium lights flicker on. They glow in tiered rows like votive candles. Sister is, 
sister of mercy, but her wind-up is brutal, her leg kick wicked. Her hooded head spits forward. The catcher's glove opens like a heart, contracts against the fastball's womp and slam. His head has stopped hoping for salvation, but his heart holds on. St organ music booms against the dome. The leadoff hitter waits. 20 years since his last confession, but he crosses himself and steps hopefully to the plate. And that's a true story. <laughs> so then I got fascinated. Thank you so much. It's not going to stay. So I got fascinated with this nun. And then I started writing more nun poems. And it became my chapbook, um, Beatrice. And I was interested not in the religious life, but how do you build friendships within the convent? How do you interact with the community? And how do you have a sensual life? And what does that mean? So this is a little bit of nunly sensuality. This is called Pearl. The day after scattering her mother's ashes in the ocean, Sister Beatrice goes quahogging. Morningscape. Clouds arranged in blurred bands of coral and pink like lipstick samples on the back of the Avon lady's hand. Twenty years inside that tombed shape nun boot, but Sister Beatrice's foot remembers its childhood skill, how to stalk the quahog, big toe trawling the tide like a predator's snout. Cool wind whirling off the waves in salt-loaded squalls. Sister's veil flaps so hard around her skull, it muffles the crackle of foam, the slap of kelp and jetsam. The clam she captures is still alive, breathy and warm in its hinged brown casket. The clam flesh dampens under her fingers, its belly slack as love in its puddle of juice, elegant neck recoiling from sister's tender pinch. She knows the danger of eating it raw, but Beatrice swallows, her head tilted gulp a remembered pleasure in her throat. No pearl to roll down the esophageal slide just a tidal rush of sand and delicious clam water splashing under her tongue. Pretty sensuous, huh? <coughs> That's how I imagined her. This is called Mirror Mirror. The nuns are not allowed to look at their own image. I mean, imagine that, that you're not supposed to look in a mirror because of the vanity. Still, Sister Beatrice craves reflection. Alone in her cell, she probes her face with the slow sculptural skill of a woman born without vision. Her fingers trace the bladed cheekbones, the small brown moles expressive as punctuation marks at the end of her mouth. One in the morning, Beatrice sneaks into the convent kitchen. There's no chrome toaster to tempt the sisters, not a sliver of silver glass. No stainless soup spoons with their inverted gazing bowls, but there's a ceiling fan, metal bladed. Sister looks upward as if seeking sweet heaven. The metal blades, slowly slicing air, show slimmering flickers of Beatrice. She sees her nose, its humped topography, the sudden twist just below the bridge, the strands of hair pushing out of, out of her veil, 
like the night-seeking roots of the moonflower plant. Beatrice's mouth is too lush for a nun's mouth, but there it is, quick pink kisses on the whirring fan blades. Beatrice stares into faint blue eyes, the pupils widening like ecstatic cervixes. So this, this is what Sister Veronica sees when she looks at Beatrice. So my last one is called Color Boy. And there is a fascinating story. On my birth certificate, my dad's occupation is listed as color boy. Um, and the color boy was the person who would lift up pails of dye in the textile mill and put them into the press as the press was going. And he would come home splattered with this foul smelling dye. It smelled like burned plastic. Um, and I often wondered about that because my dad suffered from a lot of strange immuno illnesses, and he got bladder cancer, which was a strong risk factor for working with synthetic dyes, and that just drove me crazy. Um, and um, so, color boy, my father's occupation as listed on my birth certificate. Blind in one eye, Daddy could name the blue-green shades in a worker's blood. Cyan, cerulean, celadon, jade. Could list the shades of violet in a thunderhead. Lavender, lilac, hyacinth, mauve. He could see a cultured pearl flush from anemic white to cerise as it warmed in the hollow of a rich woman's throat. Daddy's sighted eye was trained to die, D-Y-E. At home, he refused to talk about the job, but nights when he called the union steward, I heard steam kettles, double shift on New Year's Eve, the hell heat of it, how even though the men stripped down to Bermuda shorts and sleeveless bibs, their eyes stung with sweat. They had to keep blinking if they wanted to see. And just the other night, the Russian guy fainted dead away, indigo steam rising from his limbs. And Bullhead Blanchard had to lift him off the floor and ride him on his broad French shoulders to the nurse. On days when the pattern was hearts, Daddy came home splattered with red, stains thick as blisters under his nails. When Daddy had to work a, f a double shift on his 40th birthday, I brought a chocolate cake to the mill. No candles allowed, no flames. The dust-encrusted air was an easy inferno. Daddy had to wait a couple of hours for his break. I roamed the seven floors, watched bobbins spin out thread, 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 looms spit out cloth, 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 sewing machines hum out, shirts, shirts, shirts. Then there's a break, part two. The ocean unfurls its bolts of crisp white organza. I study the sunset, how a June day bleeds out slow, a seeping chest wound. I squint to find the greenish sheen in the blood, a pale sage, I sense rather than see. Daddy would have loved these celestial hues, skeins of hyacinth mist on the horizon, a swatch of cyan sky, clouds of slubbed silk floating through twilight's dye bath. The sun succumbs to dusk. I wait for the last drop of color to drain from the sky. In darkness deep as polished onyx, I pour my daddy's ashes into the cerulean sea. And thank you for coming. <laughs>
and I want to thank um, Southbridge for welcoming us. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called uh, Field Trip Home. And um, there's some French in it, which I'll translate. Um, we have the curé, who's the priest, the feast, the son, the field, the daughter, um, petit fils, neveu, uh, grandson, nephew, au lieu de français, instead of French, je désire de vous entendre, comprenez-vous, I want to hear you, do you understand, l'authenticité, the authenticity, and le grand chemin, a notre identité, the highway to our identity. There's an epigraph to this poem. It's by Adrian Rich. This is the oppressor's language, yet I need it to talk to you. There are only back roads to my past. Going back, I think I know the way from Bondsville to Thorndike, Sturbridge to Southbridge. I disregard the map, bank the van into curves like a bobsled, and forget everything but half-remembered dips in the road. Then I skid across the bridge. There is always a bridge, and I'm on Main. The duplexes and three-deckers perched on the sides of fierce little hills still want paint and repair. Crooked, rotting balusters fall out like teeth. Bicycles sprawl where grass never stood a chance. Rain gutters sag. Still, that peculiar defiance houses here imply. Pale green clabbered raised on the edge of a riverbed choked with granite. Smokestacks and steeples jut up against the hills. Hushed, we mount the stairs in this industrial light. Worn sandstone steps muffle our school shoes as we spiral up the brick turret. Our thoughts and voices are taken away to be sorted and dyed by click, whir, and clack. We become all eyes in this din. We watch rags soak in vats, then see scummy pulp dried and pressed into egg cartons by men with corrugated brows women with skin gray as the canal below. But their eyes and hands dance a quadrille. The machines call, but can't catch. Their wrists spin patterns in and out of stainless steel as they weave in and out of the deal at lunch hour whist. Sometimes they lose bets. Sometimes they lose fingers. Docile, they make good hands never strike, vote Republican, mine their curé, supply the shift with another fils, Raymond, another fil, René. Docile students, we've been herded here. Another field trip to study what we'll never know. Yet I know more than I understand about this place, the curves in this road and staircase. I'm not a Feeney, nor a Smith. These are my people we're gawking at. I'm their petit fils, neveu. Their lips taught me English, click, whir, and clack. Au lieu de français, a tune I often still can't catch. I wanted to blurt out, je désire de vous entendre, comprenez-vous? But slunk home to check my grammar in books I once memorized under the tutelage of teachers who said Gothier, like us, instead of Gautier, mm -hmm. who studiously failed to point out l'authenticité of half the class's last names, the paved road, le grand chemin à notre identité. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I was up at St. George's Cemetery this afternoon trying to find my great-grandmother, <laughs> great-grandfather's grave. Um, those of you who know where that is here uh, will uh, recognize what I'm describing. Um, the next poem is called Vain Addicts, and I'm 
in terms of um, the word vain, I'm, I'm referring to it in two different senses, both vanity, but also being in vain, useless, or uh, ineffective. Vain addicts. Trying at night to hold it all together in my head. Ragged scraps of lace whirl above me. As if peace instead of grief could come through remembering where the hairline held before it retreated, leaving behind no tide mark, or recalling how my neck felt, my voice soared before Adam's tree dumped its apple. Insistent whiskers sprang up, repetitive as pop songs on the radio, lyrics that once felt so accurate they embarrassed me for fear that if someone guessed the one I clung to, they'd know why I'd never fit in. Today, an oldie station found me out, though I couldn't recall the group's name till I hunted down scratched 45s in my psychedelic orange fake fur carrying case under the stairs, trying to retrace what I presumed indelible. Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, Catherine Parr. Je suis tu es, il est, nous sommes, vous êtes, elles sont. The symmetry of the seventh grade. Trying to refurbish childhood. Willow wear stands in for Aunt Pearl's blue onion. I smooth rectangular wrinkles from the same soft tablecloth as my mother's and store as yellowed keepsakes of my younger self parochial school history books in a trunk among titles that haunt me. Return to Gonaway Lake, the clue in the crumbling wall, and the dishwasher takes up its rhythmic womb-like sloshing a lullaby to my middle-class psyche as I still do homework at the kitchen table. Sometimes it's as if I never moved away. Of course, some old people sell their homes to escape unmanageable memories. They either hide in the present or find themselves unraveled by the past. But after we've moved on, who will remember what we've forgotten? Decipher our checkbooks, see to our New Year's resolutions, attend our reunions? Who will make sense of our random musings, those vain addicts? Who will grope along the rasp of our lives, feeling for webs among the splinters? I am my own archivist, Trying to reassemble more than I can remember, I go back long before I was born to a priest who unrolls a cloth scroll, points out the family plot. I pace along the crest of a ridge. The cemetery looks out over nothing but trees, the mill town below obscured. There's French on every stone. We could be in Brittany or La Chine, but five rows down and six across, the one word, one surname that would have leapt out at me is missing. Even spider webs are mostly gaps. Sometimes we come up against silence so total it echoes. Unmarked graves, whole lives forgotten, perhaps more whole because forgotten, but more in vain. So the last one, I, I, this is a little bit of a risk in a public <laughs> library, but I think I can pull this off. Um, I, it's a little bit lighter. Um, it's very lighter. <laughs> the called Robert Goulet is dead. So, uh, I didn't 
deliberately set out to write a poem that included both Franco-American and gay themes. None of us do. I started this because I really, truly, really and truly was uh, attracted to Robert Goulet's deep voice when I was a little boy, okay? But, uh, and Rob as it turns out, Robert Goulet was Franco-American. He grew up in Lawrence, okay? There's a, in this poem, there's a, you know, his nickname, the nickname I use for him is Tigar, little boy, little guy, okay? And um, I think that all of us, maybe th except for one person in the second row, is sophisticated enough to know that the poet and the speaker are not the same person, okay? So the speaker in this poem took over big time. And I, I had to get out of the way and just let him do his thing and just want to say, all right, here we go. Robert Goulet is dead. With your demise, one surefire aphrodisiac flickers, but never goes out. Five years old, hips jammed against the fabric front of our cabinet-sized stereo, I slithered to where hidden speakers buzz beneath, bolster me, holster me, tingle of your baritone. Coxswain and oarsman, deep and firm and strong. If ever I should leave you, even down the hall I'd tent, hardwired hard -wired eardrum to hardwired taint. If I place the disc just so, we'll move together again. Morocco me, embargo me, beverage, and gargle me, roll me up and cabbage me, stallion as I lather you. Have me on a platter, please, if you fancy food. Just thrust all through a low note. I wait and marinade. You growl the deep down way. You sound the sure vibrato. You growl the deep down way there. Your dying father made you vow to use the gift Dieu gave. Merci, Père, for handing Tigar the key that turns the bolt in me. Wire me, high note, fire me, conduit of dream. I'm a socket waiting to be plugged, a glance waiting to be met. Weak need, obvious, a dizzy, cheap, drunk, shish kebab, meatballs laid out on a buffet. Ladle me, cradle me, if ever you should leave her, reflect and connect me, me, me. Look up my number on any heavenly wall. <laughs> Thank you. people um, have read. So uh, this is not a Franco-American poem. <laughs> it is called I Am In Love With Rita Moreno. <laughs> we go to see West Side Story, my best friend and I. We are 12. This is our first grown-up movie. It opens with a shot of New York City and a sharp whistle. This is real. This is a neighborhood. I am swept away by the music, the jazzy beat, the dancing down the streets, under the highway, in parking garages. I will tell my parents the soundtrack is all I want for Christmas. For years, my sister and I will sing the songs, dance in the kitchen while washing dishes. On the way home, my friend tells me she is in love with Bernardo. Who do I love? I don't know. I'm still dancing with the women on the roof. Our hands meet over our heads, and now my arm is around her waist. We lock eyes and walk in a circle around each other. Now we are swishing our skirts high, stamping our feet. I will be her skirt. I will be her shoes. I will be the flower she wears in her hair, the shawl she wraps around her shoulders. I'm in love with Rio Moreno. <laughs> <laughs> Good response. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <coughs> 
So I think I'm going to uh, start with a couple of, of uh, high school poems. I read this poem um, in Michigan, and uh, so so my family is French Indian, uh, French Canadian, French Indian, um, and there's some some things about that here. Um, I read this when I was in Michigan, and people came down from the reservation in the Upper Peninsula, and they said. Um, when you started to read this, I thought you were going to read, you were going to say the poem, the first poem I ever heard. And I said, what's that? And they said, Frenchie, Frenchie, ooh la la, 14 kids and no papa. <laughs> and I thought, well, nice to see that the stereotype just like, you know, goes all the way down. <laughs> so um, there's one piece of sort of sharp language in this that I'm going to like tone down so you'll know, I think, when I do. <clears throat> French girls are fast. French girls are fast. I find this out before I know what it means. Two days in the Irish Catholic school my mother thought would keep me safe from sin, and the name is following me around. Frenchie, hey Frenchie, ooh la la, the Irish boys leer, staring at the roundness I am not ashamed of, the Irish girls still properly flat beneath their uniform jackets. I learned quickly to sneer, light my cigarette with a wooden match flipped against the brick school wall taste the smoke, roll it over my tongue, and exhale upward in a gesture of exquisite boredom. <laughs> I tighten my face, turn to look them up and down, and spit out the prayer of this place. Eat it, buttheads. <laughs> Years later, it is a grandmother who accuses me, and I hear it again. French girls are fast. Who am I to say otherwise, my belly pushing outward with her grandson's child? She admonishes me not to rest my hands on my belly. You'll ruin the baby touching yourself like that. <laughs> my hands fly away for a moment like frightened birds looking for another place to perch, then settle back down. She shrugs and turns away. Later, she digs out a blanket she bought at Niagara Falls. From those Indians, you know, she tells me, shaking her head, clicking her tongue. But the blanket is nice, she says. You can use it. <laughs> I will not tell her now, my father's family is Indian, that the blood was mixed in me generations ago. My hands accept the white wool, finger the stripes of red, yellow, black, green. I draw it over me, the child, my unruly hands, feel my body slowing, getting ready for the long push ahead. <clears throat> So, um, in Abenaki and Abenaki, there are no R's. And um, when I was growing up, one of the things in my family was sort of like, you know, we grow up, you just think this is, you are what people say you are. So we were French Canadian. Um, I always knew <coughs> my father was Indian, but I thought that the what that what we did, everything that we did was French Canadian. Um, <coughs> and then I met. People who weren't family who were French, and they ate this thing at Christmas time called tortilla. Mm -hmm. But we didn't. We ate something called tuke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tuke. <laughs> um, so when I found out, you know, there are no R's, I thought well, that's interesting. So tuke. <laughs> this is the pie that defines our Frenchness in the winter season. The Christmas Eve pie of twice ground pork, cooked slowly, seasoned lightly with salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. We make dozens to give away, but Uncle Raymond won't eat our pie, missing the spices his tongue demands. He calls it tortière, says there's no such thing as tuque. <laughs> but there it is, written in Mamie's book, the Indian K replacing the R, as foreign to Algonquin tongues as the spices Mamie leaves out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So when I left high school, or actually before I left high school, <coughs> I left the Catholic Church. I was in convent school. Um, actually, let me read the convent school poem first. Quick, quick one. Convent school. Because I hate the crowded halls, I duck into the quiet chapel where there's only a few of us genuflecting, kneeling in the filtered sunlight. I think I'm getting away with something. I am not saying words. I am just breathing in the silence. I don't know yet that this is prayer. 
So this is a poem called Rosary, and it takes a shape on the page. Ooh. <coughs> Not roses, but beads, the color of a summer sky. Not round, but oval, each bead leading to the next, a river of prayer. Je vous salue, Marie, plein de grâce. She was five when she saw them on display in the back of St. Anne's Church, where she would make her first communion. She thought them the cloak of the Virgin herself, gasped when her mother took money from the food allowance to put the beads into her hands. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. For 68 years, the river of beads flowed through her hands. Each night of her marriage, she and my father together prayed to the Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of, your, of thy womb. Now I am saying it with my brother, our hands across our mother's body, struggling to die or live. For three days, we pray to the mother, words I have not said for decades. When the time comes, and my brothers, the singers, cannot sing, I sing to her in Latin, I thought I'd forgotten. Ave Maria, gratia plena. Maria, gratia plena. Maria, gratia plena. Ave, ave Dominus, Dominus Cecum, Benedicta tu mulli eribus, e benedictus, e benedictus, fructus ventris, ventris tui. Now I pray, Ave Cecilia, gratia plena, Benedicta tu, you are blessed, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. You are all blessed. <clears throat> so my mother, my mother's family comes from Acadia originally. Um, then they were in indentured servitude in Westboro, Massachusetts, and finally got up to Quebec, and then came back down to Massachusetts. My mother knew very little of this history, but somehow, in all of that, she remembered that the English are our enemies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was certainly true in our town. This is a story I remember my mother and, and my grandmother talking about at the kitchen table when I was just barely old enough to understand. Aunt Delia. <coughs> Aunt Delia worked uptown, buffed the kitchen floor, shined the silver, washed the crystal, wrapped the garbage in newspaper, hung out the bleach sheets. When the uptown lady had no milk, Delia offered hers as easy to feed two as one. Over the silver tea service, the china cups, over the cake she baked, in between nursing and diapering, she heard them from the hallway saying, all those French women have big breasts, saying, they're like animals, those French women. <laughs> and I'd like to read uh, uh, it seems like we have to read my pieces to me. <laughs> we have to read so, um, pieces. So I have a new book coming out next spring. It's a memoir, and uh, it's about bipolar disorder. And um, I have a number of meme pieces, and I call them Islands of Sanity. <clears throat> so I'd like to read one or two of those. Meme stories. Sing on Meme. My husband comes home and finds me on my knees, sorting blocks and tiny cars into their bins. I enjoy putting the toys away, creating a tableau for tomorrow morning, the way my mother did on Christmas Day. All the toys and books displayed and full of possibilities. When I'm done, I sit on the sofa. I'm tired, but it's a good tired, and my heart is full. I say to him, surprising myself, today is a day of perfect happiness. And so it is. These days come often during this time of caring for my grandsons, not only moments of joy, but of knowing and appreciating my own happiness. Everything they do fills me with gladness. My daughter-in-law, exasperated, puts the crying baby into my arms. He is just two months old. She is exhausted from the pregnancy and birth and I think a little depressed. I wrap the blanket tight around him, put him to my shoulder, my cheek against his head. Sing a meme, I croon to him. Sing a meme, ah. That's right. 
My daughter-in-law looks at me, surprised. Sing a mime. Uh-huh. Then her whole body relaxes as she sits in the armchair and closes her eyes. Mm -hmm. And one more. <laughs> she sits in her armchair and closes her eyes. Yep. Meme stories, howling. We've just finished dinner and we're sitting around the table, my grandsons and I. We are talking about the wolves disguised as coyotes we've heard howling over the hill. Joe, who is five, howls to demonstrate what they sound like. Adam, just two, follows his lead. And then I join in and there are three of us howling together, <laughs> filling the evening kitchen with song. My daughter-in-law comes in from another room looking worried. <laughs> she stops when she sees all of us together howling, our heads thrown back, our voices overlapping, rising and falling, wolves around the dinner table. The boys see her and grin between their howls, their eyes lit with moonlight. <laughs> everybody for coming this evening and um, some of the poets have brought uh, some books so if anybody's interested in buying some as I mentioned earlier we will definitely would like to buy some for the collection so that if anybody at home would like to borrow them at any stage we will have them anyway here but um, I just would like to again thank the four poets for coming here this evening for really enchanting us with their wonderful words and just making uh, National Poetry Month so special for all of us. It's such a thrill to hear so many different voices mm -hmm. and to partake in something that's so special. So thank you very much. Thank and you. again, thank, thank you, you to Stephen for making it Those um, emails that come out of nowhere are always the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.